<laughs> Isn't language an amazing, amazing thing? And it's, it's, it's a constantly it evolving thing as well. It's, it, it, it doesn't stand still. It doesn't. Oh. No, and it's Which really neat to see what people say now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Dreaming English. And today we have two English teachers and we have Ken Clay from the um, from the UK and myself from the United States. So we'll all go around and um, introduce ourselves and then have a nice conversation. So I'm Kevin Henry. I'm Irish born. I spent the first 17 years of my life in Ireland, but I've been living in London since then. Um, I've done various jobs uh, in public service, local government, stuff like that. A lot of it to do with adult staff training, but I also uh, sort of slipped over into teaching English. And then I did a qualification in uh, English language teaching, uh, English as a foreign language or a second language. And I've also done my university degree in English literature and linguistics. So that's me in a nutshell. So I'm the other English uh, teacher in this group. I'm from the U.S. I've always lived in the U.S. I live, I grew up in Chicago, so I have a Midwestern accent. And then I, now I live in North Carolina. So I've been teaching English um, reading. I started with kindergartners about 30 years ago. And then um, I love teaching phonics today. So I love teaching pronunciation, vocabulary, how to say words correctly, you know, some grammar. You don't you can't speak unless you have good grammar, but that's not my focus. Usually my focus is on the differences between long and short vowels and how to say words in the American way versus the British way, things like that. And so I love um, uh, talking to international students a lot. And that's how I met Rochelle um, and Ken. I also teach uh, locally, it's what I do for a living, local students that are going through elementary school, high school for test prep and things like that, and then adults. So I teach adults how to speak better for their jobs, business English or just everyday English, um, so they can, you know, maybe get that promotion they want or whatever it is. So I love language. I love linguistics. I've never taken any linguistic courses, but I have a master's in education and I also know French so I can compare that. So, but I love looking at the, the roots and things like that of words and, and trying to help people with whatever they need. I think I'll add similar to you, I, I work in um, high school, not an English teacher, but I do all the college applications. Um, and exactly. then I'll do the financial aid applications with them. So that's just yeah. me in a nutshell, um, what I do. Can I ask you, Rochelle, before you go on to Ken, um, what accent do you have? Because uh, um, uh, Laurel mentioned what accent she had. Oh, right, right. So I'm from Massachusetts. I don't really talk like people in Boston that would drop their R's. I think that my accent is pretty neutral as far as as far as um accents go i'm told that it's like a, it's very clear and and easy to understand um but people that would live um closer to boston would probably say park the car and hob the yard well that's like the very stereotypical but they would drop those r's you need to park your car and have a yard i think you sound closer to new yorker but not quite as strong nothing for nothing nothing for nothing so you don't think that's an accent no it's it's New York. That's the way we speak. Forget about it. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was interested in. Is because uh, mm -hmm. as somebody who was brought up in Ireland for seventeen years, so I obviously had a very strong Irish accent, and living in London for so long, I know it's influenced by li living in London. Yeah. So New yeah. York is your base, is it? New York is your current base. It's close. I mean, I, I live um, three hours north of New York in in near Boston. I've heard dialect coaches talk about the difference between the Boston accent and the New York accent. And there are differences, but they're all in the East. Um, well, I'm Ken and uh, probably people will know me. I've, um, I kind of held out on lots of language forums and I've got, I kind of got into it by, by accident really, because I was on Spanish forums and people kept saying, can you help us on the English forums? And as a consequence, I kind of got dragged into quite a lot of forums. And for some some unknown reason, and I don't know how, so I'm, I've kind of ended up sort of being an English teacher without having any understanding of my own language. So most <laughs> of the time, I, it's it's just speaking to people and just helping in that way or just slightly correcting things and just leaving messages. So I think, unfortunately, there are going to be quite a few people I'm speaking with a very northern accent somewhere in the world, so <laughs> I apologise in advance for all of those who are learning English and learning my pronunciation of various words. 
I am sorry to you all. So sorry. I don't think you have a bad pronunciation. I think you do just I fine. Agree. So don't put yourself down. You're good. And I think Absolutely. like what I see you doing, Ken, is like teaching in what I call context, which is how I teach. Like you'll make this little video of how you are um, like cooking something and you show the kitchen and you're showing all the stuff and like you're teaching mm -hmm. the people in context. I've learned mm -hmm. best by like and I learned best by that. It's no grammar mm -hmm. at all. It's just all stories and all um, right. conversation. And so I think that's what's great about what you're doing in the groups is like really teaching people by context. Yeah, yeah. There's a mm -hmm. few English teachers on YouTube that I respect. Vanessa is one of them and she does the same thing cooking shows with her her son or whatever and then she just picks up vocabulary words or idioms that she wants to highlight gives them as a pdf and that's how you learn and she also mm -hmm. has a, a, a membership i want to emulate that someday i think that would be awesome but i do little videos on youtube that are like points of grammar or points of pronunciation like the difference in pronunciation between love and blood there's no difference it's just spelling difference or the difference between breathe and breath or you know things like that so um, I love pointing out the differences because my students say, oh, blood? No, no, it's not blood, it's blood. Let me make a video on that. And then I'll do that. Mm -hmm. So I love doing that kind of thing. And when you find out what works for you, what your point of you know, expertise is, why not share that with other people? You know, mm -hmm. Find a way, these are like two minute videos. So I just started doing them this year. I decided I gotta do something that's short and sweet because people don't have a long attention span. So let's just point out a couple of words, you know, maybe words that people confuse, like accept and accept or things like that. And then we can just put them in a short video where people, you know, watch it and get more value. Yeah, absolutely. I, I kind of do the same thing. Like I have, I started doing like things with the YouTube shorts that are like one minute or less teach a little type teaching idioms is something that I can teach in context. I can draw pictures. Yeah. I can, like sometimes I'll change the background and I'll have yeah. the background kind of like help tell the story of what I'm talking about. So similar things right. like that. Yeah. It's probably one of the most difficult areas for a, la a language learner actually, because idioms just don't follow particular rules as such. Right. And you take say an idiom of two words and you've got a verb and a preposition and separately they work quite differently and together in yes. this unique situation they take on this new meaning and right. you, there isn't even a formula that you can give to students to say well if this happens then you know this is an idiom or right. that kind of stuff right. so you just well, have to learn idioms and as you said Rochelle it's another example of learning in context um, mm -hmm. um, because how do you how do you know when you're using the idiom correctly and that's so true. that's really difficult to teach. I, I have great sympathy for language learners. Yeah. You know. And I always can tell when somebody is from another country like Britain, um, when they use a, a, a idiom that I wouldn't use. Yeah. Like, um, you know, just something that that, oh, no, we don't say that in America. But, you know, you might say it over there. It is perfectly normal. But um, there's a lady that's on my Laurel's Learning Lab on um whatsapp and she's also on my facebook page and she sometimes gives um examples of this guy's training and she is really studious she's from vietnam i think and she says i i learned these five idioms this week and this is how i think i say them and i'm like yeah that's good but i've never heard this video idiom so mm. i don't think we use it here you know or she'll yeah. maybe usually she says the right uh, when i do sat prep for example you know with americans sometimes they don't get how to use you know or maybe there's words that they don't know very well they've learned something for the first time and they don't use it correctly so you're right it's difficult yeah. to know how to use them correctly yeah there's an idiom actually that i always assumed was american in origin and it turns out americans don't recognize or a lot of americans don't recognize it and it's, and it's an incredibly popular one on these islands you know the uk uh -huh. and ireland um, which is somebody has lost the plot. Some, if you lose the plot, I mean, Ken recognizes it immediately. But it's uh, an incredibly, com it's very, it's a very powerful one. It's, um, it's informal. You wouldn't use it in a formal situation, but it's very popular and very common. And it just means, you know, you've lost the plot. You've lost the thread of, or you've lost a sense of logic. And right. you just say you've lost the plot. And to me, it sounded American, you know, like Hollywood or something, Hollywood plots. No, nope. And it no, turns out it's not it American at all. Have you heard of it before? No, no I haven't. Lost no, I haven't. Lost the plot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I lose the plot Very quite regularly, to be perfectly honest. It's incredibly mm -hmm. popular. Yeah. 
and it's yeah. very expressive. It's very expressive. That, that's what I like about idioms. Yeah. Yeah. You've let the yeah. cat out of the bag. You spoiled the, bag. the surprise. You can know, of worms. You've opened. Okay. Yes, can of worms. Can that's of worms. a good one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All those so they, are fun. They have a lot in common as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And I always tell my students um, or anybody that asks, you know, think of it as a literal thing at first, like somebody kick the bucket. What does that mean? You kick a bucket. Mm. Well, where does that come from? That comes yeah. from when somebody was hanging and then they had a bucket under them and somebody kicked the bucket. That means they died. So mm -hmm. it's now figurative. Did you really die or did somebody? No, it's just, a, you know, figurative thing. Or maybe yeah. it is a literal thing. Maybe we use them as a euphemism. So a euphemism is when you say something nice about mm -hmm. something that's unpleasant. Indeed. So kick the bucket is one of those. I think you're right. I think a lot of them are historically literal, um, but they've they've been um, semantically bleached or or shifted <laughs> in the semantic right. meaning. So mm -hmm. I've That's done ones too where I look up the whole like historic History. like where did it come right. from? Yeah. So okay. in, in things like that, it, I there was a number of them. Like one of them was like an arm and a leg, which I thought mm -hmm. was like okay if you had a painting. And you wanted to have your arms and legs, it would cost more, but it didn't actually <laughs> come from that. It was like, no, it was the same amount of money. Like, it just matters how big the painting is. Um, but it was actually coming out of like war when the, the cost of war was people were losing their arms and legs. That's where the actual, but people, there's like this whole like mythology that people think that it came from when, when people were making paintings that they would charge you more if they included your arms and legs. Like, no, that wasn't. That's normal. crazy. There's a lot of misconceptions, aren't there? Yes. Mm. So then I'll make yeah. a video about that and, you know, like kind of mm. like teach, you know, the meaning of it, but then also like a little bit of historical context, because I think that will make it a little interesting and maybe people will like remember it if I teach that historic yeah. context. Yeah. I have mm. a couple of British ones, if you guys want to mm -hmm. uh, hear these. Uh -huh. So the first one is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Really? That's a British one. Yeah. I would have thought yeah. that would be universal, yeah. Amazing. Well, maybe it is, but the reason that I say it is because the way I heard it, and you know, you hear um, histories of, of um, where these sayings came from, and what the story is, is that back in Britain in whatever, 1600s, 1700s, when they didn't have running water, they just had one bathtub. Everybody used the water in this bathtub, and you only got to take a bath like once a week or once a month or whatever. So mm -hmm. the father went first because he's the patriarch then the mother, then the kids, then the baby. By the time the baby gets in the bath water, it's so murky, you can't even see the baby in there. <laughs> so don't throw the baby so out with the bath water. Yeah, so and the what, second what? one is when it's raining cats and dogs and there's a thatched roof and they're, they're animals, but cats and dogs are up there for the warmth. And then all of a sudden it starts raining and then they slide off the roof and people are thinking, oh, it's raining cats and dogs. Mm. So, so the have baby you and heard the, bath the water, explanations? What, what's the, what's the, you do, do you know what the baby and the bathwater, how it's used in modern British English, or you just know the history of it? You know, the history, well, I think what it means is don't, um, don't nix a project just because you don't like one detail about it. Exactly, yeah. Don't throw out the good with the bad, basically. Exactly. With great respect to babies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And raining cats yeah. and dogs, I don't really know. I mean, oh, in, in French, the saying is, it's raining like hordes. So uh -huh. the water is so thick that it's raining like hordes. So it's a similar expression, meaning the same thing, but it, it doesn't sound the same at all. Yeah, cats and dogs is, it's raining very heavily, basically. That's all exactly. it means. Mm -hmm. it's a long yeah. Which is one of those yeah. things which is not really used today. I mean, I wouldn't use it. I'd, I'd, I'd probably say it's hammering it down or it's lashing it down, but... The last time I wow. used cats and dogs is is yonks ago. I mean, absolutely, I can't remember. It's but I, I, you see it all the time as something which is taught, and I keep saying to people, "Well, it's good to know it, but actually, <laughs> I, I I I wouldn't use it, and I really don't I know. come across that many British people." I, well, who I, I think. Use it. I mean, I use it for sure. And then I guess in all other languages, or at least every person that I've spoken to, like in Spanish and French and in Italy, they'll say that they say the same thing. 
Like they might mm-hmm. have some other things to say. It's raining hard, but they also will say in in their own language, it's raining cats and dogs. So it must be pretty yeah. universal. And you will yeah. you will have regional ones. I mean, that one you mentioned, Ken Hammering, is not one I'm familiar with. So you will yeah. have regional British sayings as well. Mm. Yeah, the Hammering one down, I think, is very much northeast. Um, I mean, I think it's one of the things that if you're a native, you're going to pick it up. And you, I mm. suspect you will pick up the variation. So if you change the animals in terms of the raining, you're going to understand yeah. what it's about <laughs> because you know, it, it's, it's, it makes sense. I mean, I know in terms of some of the idioms I, you know, I'm aware of, uh, the history is quite important. They, and I think a lot of them actually come out of the military as well. So seven sheets. To the wind. Know, um, to the I, wind I, I do know, or yeah. seven sheets. Seven sheets to the wind, isn't it? Isn't seven it? sheets isn't it? to the wind. No, so what is what drunk. is that meaning? Because I'm not familiar with that one. Seven sheets is you're drunk. Oh, oh right. Okay, right. Or as we maybe I have heard that one, but I haven't like. Yeah. One yeah. thing I learned yeah. when I went to Britain when I was in school because I was an English literature major. So we went to London, Ireland, and Wales um, for my senior summer semester. So mm-hmm. one thing I learned when I was in Britain, and I didn't drink a lot, so I hung out with these British guys for a little while that that drank, and they're like, oh, we're going to go get pissed. I'm like, go get mad? No, yeah. no, we're going to go get drunk. I'm like, oh, yeah. that's what it means. Yeah, but I've noticed that with the, with American TV programs. Um, generally, it seems to be, you know, to be pissed is to be uh, angry in American yes. English. But I, yes. I've also heard Americans using it in the British way of, <laughs> Some uh, uh, no, actually no. It's the other way around. Um, to be yeah. pissed off would be the Eng- the British version yeah. of pissed. Um, okay. But I've heard Americans use that as well. Some Americans use that as well. I guess you off. don't need the off to be angry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> can I, can, um, Laurel, yeah. can I just point something out which is quite interesting? And this is yes. this is a language, but of a different sort. Never do that to a British person. It's actually this? offensive. Yeah. Really. That's offensive. That's not. Huh. Okay. That comes under the banner okay. of semiotics, I think. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I that, you know, know. It's, it's this thing about language because language isn't just language. I mean, right. it's, you know, that, there are gestures which, Body which language don't too. translate between, mm. yeah. between cultures. And you There's, would think they would, but they don't. But yeah. And it's, it's purely I know British. it's not good to point at somebody like, don't do this, right? This is what <laughs> yeah. you're doing. But, mm. um, you know, I, I, you know, I don't mean to, I mean, this is victory or this is victory. I'm not sure which That's one. That's victory. <laughs> yes, that would be victory. That's a bit like that <laughs> in terms of how, how it works in Britain. So, you know, lang, lang, I, you know, I'm going to say language is more than just what comes out of your mouth. You know, body language. I mean, there are certain gestures you wouldn't do in Spain yeah. or Italy or, or, or elsewhere right. because they're actually, they don't have the same significance in other, yes. in other cultures. Mm-hmm. And you would have right, thought, you know. Right. So um, it's just an FYI. <laughs> I didn't even realize I was doing it. So you know, well, you wouldn't because it's it, it's not it's not yeah. culturally culturally relevant. Mm. I do point it out to people at times. So I mean, I do this a lot. British That's person. okay, right? That's fine. That's I do that all the time. Yeah. I regularly do that. <laughs> you know, it's all it's all forms of communicating. I mean, so many times when I'm talking to people, I I use the visual language to. To right. help clarify things or to give right. Um, right. You know, confirmation that they're doing something right. Because mm-hmm. I think, you know, one of the things as a language learner as well is, oh, some of these problems you have just getting your head around. And I, I, I'm pretty, you know, idioms, I'm trying to explain idioms to people. It's like they are just totally illogical at times. You just kind of think, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> they, you know, other languages just don't seem to have them in the way that we do. And you wonder how the hell. English has developed. I mean, I, I always call English a dog's dinner of a language because I, I do think it is because you look at Spanish and it's logical. You know, the, the, the grammar's logical to an extent. I mean, you know, it's it's 99, it's 90% logical, 10% illogical. It seems to me that English is 10% logical and 90% illogical. I don't know. I mean, I'm not a teacher, so uh, I... Did you recognise that expression, dog's that? dinner? Dog's dinner, is that an I've expression? I've never no. heard that. Yeah, because I when I heard Ken say it, I thought, now that's probably one... That you've never heard dog's dinner yeah Ken. no i haven't dog's i haven't dinner. heard that me neither yeah you're making a mess what does you're it making mean a mess of something you're making a mess okay. of something totally yeah. A mess. Mm-hmm. yeah 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 so you know how you might mash up the dog's dinner oh, i kind of use it to mean that it, it works it feeds the animal but it doesn't look <laughs> particularly great and i think you know that's how i describe english when i have this like you know, it works it does what it needs to do 
But if you right. look at it against a logical language, yeah. it's right. going to go, this is a mess. This is a complete I mean, I, mess. I think of it as like a, like a mud of a language because it's a mix of like, you know, dramatic yeah. and, and Latin yeah. and some Greek in there and just like the mud of languages. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of languages that feed into English to make it multicultural, you know, and that's why there's so many roles. So, and yeah. that's why yeah. the spelling has changed. That's why everything is the way it is. Um, and also, you know, you have um, mistakes that happen with, with if you don't have a silent letter in there, you know, silent letters are there for a purpose. And so if you don't have that, then it could be plain or it could be planned. Which one is it? You know, hop or hope. And so you have to say them right so people understand it. And it, it, there's not a, there's sometimes there's a faux pas, something bad that um, somebody will say because you didn't spell it right. Oh, wow. So, uh huh. Um, I love French expressions, putting them in our language. You know, faux mm. ami is a false friend. So that's a mm. word that means something. I was just going to ask both 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 Karen uh, and Laurel. I mean, because because you're dealing with foreign students, do you see do you see certain languages having problems with English, and are they sort of fairly consistent? Do some languages pick up on English easier than others. I mean, have you have have you guys noticed anything about working with well, the, the, the Latin, but uh, the the Germanic languages and the Latin based languages. Um, in, this is obviously from a European perspective. Uh, those speakers tend to have it, it, find it easier to learn English. Whereas if you've got somebody coming from Sino-Tibetan or any of the Indian languages, um, they've. I mean, uh, uh, one word that uh, people beyond Europe have great difficulty with is accountant, because mm -hmm. you know, to, to French speakers or Spanish speakers, it sounds very similar to something like they know. Whereas to a Japanese person, it's completely different and they have, mm -hmm. they can't connect it at all to their own language. So, yeah, right. there, there, there are vocabulary problems sometimes that mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. students have problems with. There's cultural things, too. So, I mean, I know that people from like the Middle East love to call people dear, like, OK, dear. And that is not something that I would say you can call me right away because I don't know you that well. Mm. You know, oh. so they they and also they sometimes call me sir. Because I'm like, I'm like, no, you call me ma'am. Well, where does that come from? Madame. Okay. You mm -hmm. know, and so they're all confused. Well, what do I call you? Miss Archer? Okay. Now well, I'm married, but miss is easier than missus. You know, so it's all this whole like cultural thing of how you say things. I was thinking as we were talking about that is that like the Spanish, so they'll always say like, it's always like um, love, like, um, or um, like mi amor, um, for everybody it doesn't right. matter like my co-worker right. so like she was always like every everyone is mi amor mi amor um mm -hmm. all the students and that's like just how she it's the same thing as dear like it it's right that's how she addresses people it's interesting because i i helped the young guy from um nepal and he calls me teacher he just calls mm -hmm. me teacher doesn't right. use my name and then a lot right. of people go mr ken and i keep i keep right. saying that you can't do that in english it works mm. in your own language. You can't do that in English. It's just wrong. Mr. Clay, but Mr. Ken, you can't do. Um, mm. Coming back slightly, in the UK, you're talking about Spain. Where I come from, we use the word pet. Hello, yeah. pet. How are you doing? If you got a Yorkshire, hello, duck. <laughs> then you go somewhere else. It's hello, him. I'm trying it's to remember Glasgow. what else. Um, but you get love Scotland. as well. Hello, love. And all these things are really right. common as you go around the UK. And right, they're not right, seen as right. offensive. They're just part of right. the culture of the language of that. If I was area. in Ireland or in the UK and somebody called me love or pet, I, you know, if they were a nice older woman, I would have no problem with that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I mean, that's just I because suppose... that's the way it is in the UK. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. regionally, those words, of, 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 not so much affection, but just those words we use when we refer to other people. They, they change, they literally change from city to city, from area to area. Um, I get well, sister I a lot, from, especially from people from India. I'm um, sister. Everybody yeah. is like, my yes. dear sister. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it's out of respect, but dear sister. And I think Caribbean people use auntie and uncle quite a bit in the oh, same yes. way. Oh, yes. 
very respectful thing. In to Spanish, because they, they, I think they always call anybody Tio and Tia, so that's Tio, like, yeah. interesting. Yeah, but it's interesting, Laurel, I think you, I don't know, you kind of reacted when Ken was talking about the word love, because um, I think there's a gender issue there as well with the word love, mm -hmm. that if, as a woman, if a man, maybe a young man, I mean, and it's all situational as yeah. well, sometimes it'd be perfectly okay, even with a man, but I think it's more likely to be offensive if a man calls a woman love, because yes. it has all sorts of power dynamics going on mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. cases, uh, particularly right. in formal situations. You would not expect it in a formal situation. No. Anybody or somebody loves. Right. It's very informal. Yeah. A lot of it is is sort of in a in a merchandising situation where you're in a shop or a store or at a market or something like that. Where some you know they, that's the most common use. But um, I mean, even in London, and it's, it's very rare now. But I remember years ago. You would even have men, and there would usually would be very traditional Londoners, Cockneys probably, and they would call men love. And you think, what? <laughs> yeah. But um, I mean, obviously, but the big one in the UK is mate. Offensive. Just the, the way mate. they spoke. And it, Australian yeah. too. Mate would be fine, yeah. Mate. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the, the, the Aussies and the Kiwis use it, but it's it's it comes from, again, it's a naval term. It's a naval mm -hmm. term, but it's, a, it's the First standard. I suppose it's the standard one in the UK is mate. How are you doing, mate? You're all right, mm -hmm. mate what's happening right. and it's all mate and that's it again it's one of those things that tends to be male to male not so much mm -hmm. to female it just it always strikes me as yeah. a bit of an odd one when you use it towards a woman but i right. haven't heard women use it within themselves so you know with groups of women huh. but um it's you know it's how how it's changing ken it's changing i think things are changing because it's even you. like the guys like hey guys and it doesn't matter um, the gender that. Yeah. Yeah. That sometimes, I mean, well. I call women guys and I'm like, well, maybe they don't understand that I'm saying it's guys and girls. Yeah. So it's you true. Know, I mean, it's the same in the that. UK these days. You go into a restaurant, you. Y'all. You know, if your country, the waiter, you're going to say y'all. <laughs> Well, this has yeah. been a great conversation. Maybe we can do this again. I just want to like be mindful of time. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we I definitely need to have a part two. Yeah, yeah we should all come up with three idioms and then bring them to the table. But in, in, uh, one <laughs> yeah. thing, I, real quick, um, and it was like the conversation when I first met Ken was here in Massachusetts, and I think it's now worldwide, but here in Massachusetts, we started saying wicked, like wicked good cupcakes, wicked good pizza. And I know that it's spread around the world, but we have like, in fact, the Wicked Good Cupcake Company that is based in Boston and mother and daughter, you know, duo mm -hmm. that started making That's this Wicked funny. Good Cupcakes for this Wicked uh -huh. Good Pizza, Wicked Good This, Wicked Good That. And I know it's like all New England and now probably spread. I think people in um, other countries say it, but it started here in Massachusetts. The it's very good. Yeah. In the UK, I've never wicked. heard that before. I've never heard Wicked I mean, you will hear, you know, in a very slangy, informal way, you'll hear, but mm -hmm. you'll never hear good with it. Wicked, yeah. you know, includes good. So something is wicked or it's yeah. sick. Yeah. It's almost like an oxymoron, right? It's absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> Isn't language an amazing, amazing thing? And it's, it's, it's a it constantly is. evolving thing as well. It's, it, it, it doesn't stand still. It doesn't. Oh. No, and it's Which really neat to see what people say now. Yeah, what so. it's really. I mean, only look. I mean, you know, looking at old films, the way language has developed and how we use like words now, which uh, were not used fifty years ago, uh, have been dropped, or the meaning has now changed. So I will point out one thing with the uh, British is that you either say the T really strong or you don't say it at all. Yeah. The T. So tea. the T, like little, mm. little versus yeah. li little. The the glottal stop. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, there's, a, there's, a, there's a guy I know, one of the forums, he, he kind of analyzes language and he's con slightly confused by me because my accent has moved. So mm -hmm. it's moved from the northeast, and it, but it hasn't quite become southern. So it's somewhere in the middle. And he says, you know, you should be doing it this way, but you're not. <laughs> and I just, I've just evolved and developed to deal with the fact that I deal with so many foreign clients in the past. And mm -hmm. you know, if I was to speak with my native uh, dialect, uh, and, and and Kevin will know this. People would just be going, "Is that actually English?" Because it can yeah. be really, really strong. And I come from an area mm. where it is, it was, still is very, very strong. Um, and I've just had to evolve and adapt and adopt the way I speak so that become more neutral. Yes. And sometimes it's about and speed as well. Sometimes it's just about yeah, speed. It is. You slow down, mm -hmm. and people find you more intelligible. And I'll mm -hmm. make one last comment. Um, is that when I teach people how to speak English more like an American um, or they, you know, 
they understand things, then they go back home to Brazil or wherever they're from. They're like, you don't sound like a Brazilian anymore. You sound more American. So now they don't fit in anywhere. <laughs> Next time. Okay. Yeah. All the best. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank Have you, Kevin. Bye. Thank you. Peace. Bye-bye. <laughs> Peace.